coming up on show 879, the ID4 is coming to the US, which is good. How many of them? Well, the news might be bad. Stick around, I'll tell you more. Plus on the podcast today, Tesla's software gets updated uh, with more speed limit sign action, why the EPA range testing might need to be changed, and congratulations to uh, Tesla for some Pikes Peak success over the weekend. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily for the start of the week and the last day of the month. Monday, 31st of August, Martin Lee here, going through every EV story so you don't have to. And sometimes I do like to go through the selection of cars on myev.com. If you are thinking of possibly one day maybe getting into an EV, maybe you're an EV owner already and you want to see the state of the market, has your car price gone up or down? That might not be a crazy thing to say. I sold my first EV for a, a small profit just because you know, I bought it before they were popular and then all of a sudden everybody wanted one. So check out the prices at myev.com in the US and let me know how you get on. So, Tesla did well at Pikes Peak. Not Tesla the company, as in they weren't competing as a manufacturer, but the Pikes Peak hill climb uh, with Gran Turismo welcomed three Model 3s to the field yesterday, Sunday, August 30th. They've been racing for the... Oh, they've been going up the hill for the last week, starting early in the morning, about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, because it's a public road, and they open it to the, the public at 10am every day. Um, America's Mountain was taken on by three unique Tesla cars, one of them driven by Blake Fuller, one by Josh Allen, and one by Randy Post. Uh, now, two of those cars took first and second place as Tasmanian. Blake Fuller, who I've talked about on this podcast before, many of you know the Now You Know channel on YouTube, uh, all associated with that Model 3. A 2018 Model 3 won the race with the best time uh, and an unofficial time of 11 minutes and 2 seconds. Uh, Randy Post uh, was the runner-up in the new Tesla unplugged performance car. This is the one, if you've seen the pictures on the internet, if you've seen a written off Tesla, because Randy had a big crash a couple of days ago, and it was a wreck. I mean, the back end of the car was a wreck. I think on Thursday or Friday, uh, they bought a new Model 3 performance from Tesla, and clearly I think Tesla probably got involved here to make sure that they could uh, expedite their process to make sure they got the car. They ripped out the... I think the front and the back end axles, basically, and all of the motors and everything like that, put it into the wrecked car that Randy had crashed, and then they raced yesterday. Incredibly, the car did very well. A bit down on power, definitely not optimum, but also coming in just behind uh, Blake Fuller's Tesla Model 3. 11 minutes, 2 seconds on that. Sorry, 11 minutes, 4 seconds on that. Uh, I think Tesla did either supply or three Tesla engineers volunteered to help the rebuild process over a frantic 48 hours. So well done to Tesla uh, for those three engineers coming along to make sure that the car was put back together again, you know, safely as well for everyone, but also to uh, try and do the race. And they did yesterday. It was an amazing achievement to get second and they feel they could have gone a lot faster. But congratulations to everyone racing their electric cars up Pikes Peak. These kind of things are great because, you know, it's been a petrol head paradise for so many years and when electric cars go up it like the vw idr like these stories and of course the romance of that tesla getting wrecked the model 3 getting wrecked a few days ago randy absolutely fine by the way the driver um, and then getting back on the road it's just like that sort of zero to hero tale amazing josh allen by the way the other driver that did have a bit of an accident uh, he is a little more poorly and i think he's going to be in a either a neck brace or a back brace for something like three months so get well soon josh and see you back racing again very soon all right lead story today uh, volkswagen of america's ceo scott keogh told automotive news publisher jason stein in a podcast interview to be broadcast this week the id4 supply will be tight for the u.s dealers until production of the id4 begins in chattanooga and if you've been paying attention to the podcast recently that yes will be in 2022 according to automotive news check out the article i'll link through to it at the end of the podcast uh, vw is using an online reservation system in north america it's a hundred bucks refundable deposit and then you put another 400 down when you configure but even then it's still fully refundable it's the first time that they've done vw have done this kind of uh, tesla slash audi style pre-ordering because audi did it with the e-tron uh, of course tesla did it with the model 3 
battery and it generates headlines because you can say, and the Cybertruck, because you can say, hey, you know, 500,000 Cybertruck reservations, 704, a million Cybertruck reservations. No one really knows. Plenty of speculation out there. So VW doing that model and only asking for a hundred, not a thousand dollars down. Um, deposits are fully refundable, like I say, until you actually get the car in your driveway. The actual sales price of the ID4 hasn't been revealed or announced, and actually it won't be set by VW. The actual sales price of the car will be set by local dealers. Now that can differ from the sticker price, and that has also not been disclosed. Like I say, Keo suggested the ID4 sticker price would be just over $30,000 with available credits. Of course, VW are uh, eligible. And if you are eligible for the $7,500 federal tax credit, then it could bring the ID4, which is a Model 3 competitor, uh, down to around thirty grand. So that they would be winning on price. But... That's if you can get one, because they're not going to be made in North America till 2022, otherwise made in China and Germany. They will be exported, of course, to the US, but supply is going to be an issue. We've been talking about supply issues with EVs for such a long time now. And here in Europe, with the regulation changes where car makers are going to get massive fines from the beginning of this year if they didn't sell enough EVs, which is the short, short story of a very long regulatory boring story, then all of a sudden they managed to unlock it in Europe. So car makers are sending all their cars to Europe because they don't want these fines. Now that's been great for us, but terrible for other parts of the world where supply is still very, very limited. Unless, of course, you want to buy a car from a certain car manufacturer beginning with T, in which case... You see the price online, that's the price you pay, and many people uh, like to go towards that model of buying things. They don't like that. There has been EVs over the last couple of years where, and I don't know if this can happen in, in this country, dealer laws are different around the world, but I know that when there's a shortage of supply, you know, supply and demand, price goes up, and that doesn't happen with other things. So, I mean, it happens with supermarkets. If there's not enough of one thing, then they can hike the price and make more money. But other things don't. So I, I, I see both sides of it. Anyway, let's move on. Uh, Scott Keogh said, and I quote, right now, there are a lot more mouths to feed than there are vehicles. We're going to continue the fight for every car. We could probably use a few more, end quote. So maybe he's talking about the fight with the, uh, the big bosses at VW to get more of them shipped to VW of America. All right, moving on. Uh, Tesla. Uh, next in the news, Tesla are rolling out a software update to let their car's cameras see speed limit signs. They're pushing a software update so the autopilot can detect speed limit signs using their cameras. When the camera detects a speed limit sign, it'll be displayed on the dash and you uh, and the, in the car, uh, and it's used to set the speed limit warning as well, according to the release notes. Now, The Verge says, the latest software update also adds to its traffic light and stop sign control features, and it'll sound a chime if you're sitting in a green light. And that's useful, because how many times, I don't know, I, maybe I've done it myself, your mind wanders, but I, more often than not, I've found myself behind somebody at a green light. It's, it's annoying when you're at a set of lights that you use all the time. You know they only go green for a short amount, like three or four cars are going to get through. There's one junction near where we live uh, that's really notorious for that. That's so quick. And if someone's not quick off the line, then you're just going to get stuck. And so now, if someone's daydreaming, the Tesla is going to, I don't know, a chime, a bong, a bing bong. Maybe the sounds would be customable, customizable at some point in the future. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe you could customize those sounds. I'm just thinking maybe you could, you know, if you're sitting at a green light and you've not seen it, maybe your Tesla can make like a Mr. Like a Mr. T from the A-Team. Like, fool, come on. Anyway, lots of possibilities. I think I should move on. I'm feeling slightly giddy today. It's best for everyone if we make this a quick podcast. Well, there are a number of factors that make the EPA range, which is the uh, Environmental Protection Agency, the US way of measuring range in cars, uh, for EVs unachievable in real-world driving. And many people find that at highway speeds, they don't get the advertised EPA range. Uh, for starters, EVs can benefit from EPA's test speed fluctuations. They get regen braking, which can put a spanner in the works, which puts energy back into the battery. Gas cars can't do that, so you can't often directly compare. EPA gas cars and EV ranges because obviously if you're driving around town then 
a lot of regens happening, speeding up, slowing down, speeding up, slowing down, regen all the time. At highway speeds, no regen, right? Constant, 75. Uh, most gas-powered vehicles can't do that, says Car and Driver. Car and Driver got a really, really in-depth article on the EPA testing, which I've learned a lot from today. Uh, it's why gasoline-powered vehicles regularly beat their EPA highway figures in real-world tests, and yet EVs never meet the EPA range in real-world 75-mile-an-hour tests. Etron came closest for car and driver, about 7% off. Tesla's about 25, 30% off. And uh, that article I'll link through in the show notes if you'd like to read more. Also on the, the EPA issue today, uh, when it comes to range, Tesla does appear to be untouchable. Despite pouring billions into EV vehicle programs, the established automakers have so far failed to really make up a lot of ground when it comes to the range of EVs. And winning that game remains a crucial part of winning over buyers. So how does Tesla seem to do it, says Car and Driver? Like I say, big, big feature on EPA testing. Um, well worth a read, by the way. Long article. Uh, but basically, EVs are strapped to a dyno, essentially a rolling road, a treadmill for cars, if you like. And they are put through a test that the EPA do when the battery gets depleted to the point that it can no longer drive anymore. So obviously, you would stop and charge before this point but the EPA test it to when it can no longer maintain that speed. The EPA also allows automakers to run three additional drive cycles if they want and use those results if they want to. And that can earn them a more favourable adjustment factor. Currently, only Tesla and it's Audi. So Tesla and Audi are the only ones that actually opt, optionally, go for these three other tests. And those are the ones that come pretty close to their EPA range. Uh, Tesla scores very advantageous results. And and what it is, it's an adjustment, because obviously a rolling road is different to driving on real roads. There's no wind resistance and things like that. So there's a formula which happens. You do the test on the rolling road, then the EPA apply a formula, an adjustment, if you like. And the Tesla adjustment can be up to 30%. The Model Y performance window sticker range would drop to 292 miles if they didn't apply this extra adjustment. But actually, Tesla advertised 315, not 292. So, like I say, only Tesla and Audi are the ones employing this strategy at the moment. And I'll pop a link in the show notes if you want to read more, because obviously I'm not in the US, but I've learned a huge amount about the APA testing from this you know, this one article that I would highly recommend it. People often ask me as well, like, where do you get your stories from? Like, so many places. Uh, just I, My bookmarks are just full of just websites that I'll go through often, you know, sometimes daily. But there is one podcast that I listen to every single day because it, it just informs me and it informs many of those listening in the tech sector as well. When the New Yorker magazine asked Mark Zuckerberg how he gets his news, he said the one news story he follows is Tech Meme. Now, for more than two years, 700 episodes later, their podcast, the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast, has been Silicon Valley's favourite tech news podcast, been a raving success, and I listen to that every day because I pick up EV stuff on it all the time. It's a daily podcast. It's about 15, 20 minutes. I wonder where I got the idea for this podcast from. I can't possibly think. It's about the same length as EV News Daily, and... It covers all the big tech stories that you need to know so that when you have a conversation, when you're talking about these things, you are fully up to date and you aren't the one in the conversation or the person in the room going, huh, what, huh, what's this? I didn't know about this. Uh, the Tech Meme Ride Home, think of it like a TLDR of all the stuff you need to know. Uh, they're online, same as me, all day, uh, reading these things and then helping you catch up. So if you want to search in your podcast app when you finish listening to this podcast uh, for the phrase Ride Home, and you'll find Tech Meme Ride, Ride Home, highly recommend it. Uh, you can subscribe and listen to the Tech Meme Ride Home podcast straight after this one if you want to. Maybe even some EV stories that Brian will deliver on today's show. Okay, let's move on and talk about lightning systems. So... Lightning systems are lowering the price of the powertrains that they offer while adding new features. The commercial EV manufacturer Lightning announced a lowering of their prices in their 2021 battery and fuel cell vehicles by up to 50% for Class 3 to Class 8 vehicles. And the Colorado company is also adding new features, high speed level uh, 2 charging, DC fast charging, uh, more telematics, more software, remote software control, if you're a fleet manager. Um, what else? Uh, In-cab display enhancements as well for energy management. Uh, you can add these 
these retrofit lightning systems to make uh, an EV out of anything, any chassis, like a Ford Transit, a Ford E450, the 550, the Chevy 6500 XD. Uh, and I'll pop a link to that story in the show notes if you want to find out more. Inside EVs has learned about a Corvette engineering team, a slick team. I mentioned the A-team earlier. This is like the A-team within GM. Uh, And they are the top talent of the automaker, basically. And they, the Corvette team, are being moved from the global products program to the EV program. And that's led by Ken Morris. And while this may seem like a just kind of corporate announcement, it's really not, because according to Inside EVs, it doesn't mean that all of a sudden we're going to get an electric Corvette, but it means the best of the best in that company are now thinking about electric cars. The significance is very deep. Of course, we will see an all-electric Corvette one day, but this is about giving that team the freedom to think uh, deep and wide on EVs, performance, DNA that comes with the Corvette name and how that can work its way through GM as a company. That's a smart move. That's a really smart move. I hope they are left alone. I've worked for big companies, worked for small companies. Pros and cons. Worst thing about a big company, they take forever to do anything. Anything. Uh, and it's just too many people covering their own uh, behinds and making sure that Everything is documented on emails, everyone CC because no one wants to be the person to make a mistake. I've worked for small companies where literally you've got a, you know, touching to, like a dotted line to the owner almost, and things happen super quick. So I hope they do it that way rather than just getting messed up in politics. Okay, let's talk about the RAV4. RAV4 Prime is a car that, again, lots of people want. It's in short supply this year. Yeah, if you're talking to your Toyota dealers... I don't think you're going to get one soon. Hopefully they've got some orders in because it's a very popular car. It's a plug-in hybrid. It's got all-wheel drive. And unlike a conventional system that connects the front and the rear somehow, uh, remember that with EVs, the RAV4 Prime has the gas engine up the front and the electric motor out the back, and therefore it's all separate, nothing connecting them. But it means you can do funky stuff with software as well. According to Talk News, in every drive configuration they've got in the RAV4 Prime, there is every option for every type of driving. So all electric, a combination of electric and hybrid, and also hybrid only mode to preserve the battery range if you're getting into a zero emissions area. And the rear electric motor is about 55 horsepower. So not bad, actually, not bad. It can power the rear wheels for some all road and all weather traction. It's light off-roading. But the RAV4 Prime does really clever things with their four-wheel drive system that I think people listening to this podcast in cold cold climates would really appreciate if you need that extra uh, drive and traction. I'll pop a link to Talk News in the show notes. Right, final story today. The EV bus maker Proterra has expanded its battery pack offering for heavy-duty commercial vehicles like school buses and coach buses and delivery vans. Uh, They've got a new narrower battery series which fits into the standard truck frame rails, uh, but it just means they've made some efficiency gains according to inside EVs. Depending on the application, uh, the people who buy these battery systems for their EVs can, can go all the way up to 6 megawatt hours which would be a big battery. However, uh, in EV buses or trucks, usually it's about 450 kilowatt hours. Uh, In early 2021, there's going to be a 450 kilowatt hour Proterra battery system used in buses, for instance, um, for transit systems, a range of about 200 miles, about 325 Ks for a bus with that bigger battery. But it does allow high power charging as well. Uh, If you can put that infrastructure into your bus depot or maybe halfway around the route, it'll recharge the battery in a couple of hours. And that's your show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, Get in contact, leave a comment below if you're listening on YouTube, and also email me hello at evnewsdaily.com and leave a little comment. I'll get back to you. There are 878 shows in the archive. Thank you to my premium partners on Patreon. It's the end of the month, so you're going to be billed on the 1st. And so if you come to the end of your support, I hope not. But if anyone on my Patreon is thinking, oh, I've got to tighten my belt, you know, just a reminder, if you're listening to this today, you get charged on the first. But, you know, obviously, obviously, uh, I hope that, uh, that you are thinking of continuing your support because it's the only way this show gets on the air. Uh, premium partners are Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Porsche of The Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com in Hawaii. And also, it's got a great EV review YouTube channel, Derek Riley from the EV Review Island YouTube channel. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there is no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.